Well, good morning, everybody. I just thought I'd bike to church this morning, and I just kind of never quit, kind of Forrest Gump of me. So anyhow, uh, and by the way, we're, I think we're going to have a worship service this morning. I can't look at you. I got to look down. <laughs> Getting dizzy. Uh, if, we, if I don't do this well, um, and I go off the front of the stage, we're going to have us a healing service. So, so here's, there's always a point, because some of you are saying, you know, the poor man has lost his mind. Uh, So I love the bike, and here's the deal about a bike. The only way I can keep my balance is if I'm going forward. Did you get that? So say, for example, I wanted the bike and keep my balance while I stopped. That's exactly like our faith. We will fall off our faith if we try to play neutral. If we try to keep our balance while our spiritual journey is stuck or in a place of stationary. So as we begin this series on Malachi this weekend, it's really about resetting spiritual priorities and making forward progress again. Because it may not be pretty all the time. Sometimes you may be doing a little bit of circles, but at least I'm on the bike I'm going forward, and I'm keeping my balance. And this is exactly like our faith. The Bible talks about this in Revelation chapter 3, verse 15. God says, I know where your heart's at in reference to me, that you're neither hot nor cold, but since you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out. And so there is no spiritual neutral or lukewarm that is really pleasing to the Lord. Again, we can never be spiritually neutral, stopping and keeping our balance. We will fall off our bike and we will fall off our faith. Okay, did you get that? And you have no idea how glad I am I didn't go off the front of the platform. (laughs) So I'm gonna leave this here and we're gonna begin Bible study this weekend. Um, There are notes that you may wanna reach for um, that you received possibly when you came in. Also, of course, on U version, we have a digital option if you want to make notes that way. These notes are actually for the whole series of Malachi for the next three, four weeks, uh, but we're only going to do a small portion of the notes this weekend, okay? So open your Bibles to the Old Testament book of Malachi. Uh, it is the last book in the whole Old Testament. Remember, the first two thirds of the Bible is the Old Testament. The last one-third of the Bible is the New Testament. The first thing you need to know is it's Malachi, not Malachi. Okay, so that's the first thing. Let's pronounce it right. I'm going to, yeah, it's it's Italian for we ain't got no pianist today. That's, uh, (laughs) I would suspect that not only have most people of faith in American culture these days not read Malachi, most have not read in their entirety, all 17 prophets in the Old Testament. Now, when God has devoted so much sheer space in his word to one central message through the prophets, it has got to be very, very important to him, and I'll get to that in just a moment. So we're going to be resetting our spiritual priorities, but I want to give some context here that I think is vital. So I know it's 830. If you need another cup of coffee, get it. But I need you just to say, zoned in with me for about the next 10, 12 minutes as I set all important context. Remember, it's impossible to understand the word of God unless we read it in context. Thenness comes before nowness. And the people to whom the word of God was first inspired, in this case, uh, a very sort of... um, disheveled Jewish community under persecution 2,500 years ago in the Middle East. Uh, We are none of those things, and therefore it would be very difficult to understand if we don't understand the particularities of their unique circumstance, but then watch this. Once we do, and we can understand what God's word in Malachi first meant to them, then we can make a proper interpretation for our day and even more importantly, a proper application for our day. 
So that's what we're going to try to do uh, this morning. And in fact, through this whole reset series, as we reset our spiritual priorities, as we come into a brand new year. So we're looking for the transferable principles that are germane to people in the Bay in the 21st century. Now, when God inspired his word, there are 66 different books in one book that we call the Bible. 66 in one. Of the 66, 17 we call prophetic books or books of prophecy or uh, major and minor prophets. Of the 17, the reason we call them major and minor is because there are five major 12 minor, there's your 17, and the only uh, distinguishing characteristic of major or minor is not who's more or less important, it's about the length of their writings, the length of their books. So Malachi, for example, is four short chapters. I know you all did your homework and read it since I gave you that assignment last week. Thank you very much. There's only 57 verses, or rather 55 verses, in the whole book of Malachi. So it's potent, it's a, a sort of a death grip around the jugular, and it's right to the point. Now, in, we, we need to read all 17 books of prophecy in the Bible, but let me just say this. They are all for the same central pur pur purpose. If you've missed everything so far, please get this. The purpose of the prophets in the Bible is this. Their message is devoted to you and I to keep God the first love of our life. That's the whole point. In all 17 books, the circumstances and the time in history are a little bit more uniquely different, but the essence of each of the books is for us to keep God as the first love of our lives, how to get right with God, how to live right for God, how to stay right with God, and most importantly, and Malachi deals with this a lot, how to avoid drift spiritually. Now I ask you a question. Don't you think it must have been a very high priority to God that he devoted 17 of his 66 books in the Bible to the same central theme? I think so. The essential inclination of humanity in terms of matters spiritual, you know what our basic movement is? Drift. We human beings in our hearts are incredibly inclined to drift, to losing the hot passion of Christ being the first love of our life and spinning off into secularism and materialism and shallowism and uh, lukewarmness and all the other things that go with it. And the prophets like Malachi arrest that very unhealthy spiritual movement of drift in our life. Now, uh, I want you to uh, notice in chapter 3 of Malachi, you may just want to glance quickly at verses 2 and 3. Notice the Bible says that God is like a refiner's fire in verse 2, a refiner's fire. And in verse 3, because he is a refiner and purifier. That's why God has given us the books of prophecy in the Bible to refine and purify us. Because the point isn't for us just to begin our relationship with God and then we're in a stuck place. No, no. God loves us just as we are, but he loves us too much to leave us there. We are a people on our way. We are going somewhere, and the place that we are going is growing up in God. Now, if God's a refiner's fire, by the way, that's one of the definitions the Bible gives of God. God is light, God is love, God is holy, and God is a consuming fire. How does a fire refine and purify? You know the answer. Heat. H-E-A-T. Heat. In other words, God uses his prophets to turn up the heat in our life spiritually and to begin a, to burn away the impure, to begin a, to burn away the dross, that waste part of our lives, uh, that those, those character habits that are destructive and not honoring to the Lord, God uses heat to do that. And I want to say this to you. As we work our way through Malachi, you're going to get uncomfortable. You're going to get convicted. You're going to feel the need to repent. Now, you're looking at your pastor this morning. Those things are all good. 
Those are all good. If all you're ever hearing in reference to your faith is sweet words of how God can put healing balm on your owie boo-boos, which is true and he does, if that's all you're ever hearing, you're, you're engaged only in an unhealthy lopsided faith. Remember, the Lord, our God, is holy. The Lord, our God, is holy. All these things of being uncomfortable, being convicted, and feeling the need to repent, I have been feeling, honestly, constantly for the last four or five weeks as I begin to prepare to teach you wonderful people. So this is a good thing. Now know also, we're just getting warmed up. Stay with me. I know it's 8.30, but get over it. Truth almost always hurts before it heals. It's going to bite us. It's going to sting us. But watch this. When God gives us truth, he also gives us an equal measure grace. What did Jesus say about himself? Moses brought law, but I bring what? Grace and truth. You don't want truth without grace or grace without truth. Both are in balance. Grace and truth is the centrality of the message and mission of Jesus. Now, you may be saying in your mind, why does God go to all this trouble? Here's the answer. We see it in the book of Romans and many other places. God wants us to conform us to the image of his cherished son, our savior, Jesus Christ. Did you get all that? I could say the whole thing again. I can even get on my bike again. <laughs> uh, just because you and I may not recognize any symptoms of drift in our life at this particular moment doesn't mean they're not there. Just because you and I think that everything is all good with us and God doesn't mean they are. And so this is going to be a series that's going to be honest and hard-hitting. It's going to expose some things. It's going to be really transformational big biblical truth, but it will all be couched in grace. Now, let me, let me just say this. Um, I love to swim in the ocean because I love the vastness and the freedom of the ocean. One of the things that is so amazing about the ocean is the tremendous power of tides. And when you're swimming on the beach even, I remember as a little kid, I'd go in the water and I'd keep my eye on my mom. You know, I'm seven, eight, nine years old, body surfing and whatever. And I would keep my eye on my mom. And before I knew it, if I started out looking here at her straight ahead, pretty soon, in 30, 45 minutes, whatever, I'm looking at this way. And I never even noticed I was drifting along. It's the same spiritually. The tides of life, our own selfish inclinations, the pull of culture, all those things can cause drift to happen in our lives and we don't even know it. Does that make sense? This is why this is so important to the Father to include these prophetic books in the Bible. Now, several more things, and then we'll dive into the first of our 10 symptoms. Malachi, oh, no, boy, this is important stuff, important stuff. Malachi was a contemporary of Nehemiah. You say, okay. In case you don't know, Nehemiah was the guy after the Jews returned from exile, and I'm going to explain that in a minute, Nehemiah was the guy tasked with rebuilding the walls around the capital city of Jerusalem. If you didn't have walls around your city in days of antiquity, you were a sitting duck to marauding enemy armies. At the same time, there were guys like Ezra, a great and godly priest, Zerubbabel, a great builder that were tasked with rebuilding the temple. You say, John, why is the rebuilding necessary? Did it get wrecked? Absolutely. That's where I'm going with this. After the, uh, God's people moved into the promised land, as they prospered, as they had success, as they had influence regionally and globally, all of a sudden, they begin to have a drift spiritually away from God that lasted hundreds of years. It came to such a crisis point that God had to really spank his people. And so he said, I'm going to spank you with something called a, um, oh, for pity's sake, I can't grab his name. 
<laughs> I'm going to spank you with Nebuchadnezzar. I'm going to spank you with the Babylonians, and I'm going to spank you with the Assyrians. And so these marauding armies came in, conquered the people, and when you were conquered by a foreign power in those days, there wasn't just a nice peace treaty and everybody'd make nice. They killed you. They'd kill the king, the queen, all the princes and princesses. They would kill all the men of war, and then they would take the wives as essentially sex slaves and the children to be household slaves and slaves in their, their own capital cities. It was absolute vanquish when you were conquered. That's why stuff like walls were so vital. You don't have them, you're dead, literally. Ba the Babylonians took the whole nation away for a period of 70 years for God get, to get their attention, for God to give them a wake-up call. We call this the exile. Now, by the time we arrive at the book of Nehemiah, the people are, I mean, uh, uh, Malachi, the people are back in the land after being out of the land forcibly for 70 years of exile, and they need to rebuild stuff because the temple was destroyed, the walls was destroyed, their cities were destroyed, their capital of Jerusalem was destroyed. So rebuilding's going on, and here is the whole point. Here's the whole point. They almost immediately drifted back into the same sinful practices which caused them to go into exile in the first place. Did you get all that? If you don't understand what I just said, you're missing the point of Malachi. Malachi is coming at a crucible moment in the history of his people. You have a people returning from exile, rebuilding their whole nation, and they're immediately drifting into sin again. And that's the point of the book of Malachi. Okay, you with me on that? Now, so apparently they didn't get the message very well. The next thing we need to know about Malachi is this. It's the last of the 17 prophets. It was written, and we know that he was a contemporary of Nehemiah, Ezra, Zerubbabel, I already told you that, about 500 B.C., so uh, 2,500 years ago. But watch this. This is key. After the book of Malachi was written, there were no more books added to the Bible for 400 years we call that the intertestamental period. In other words, the period between the Testaments, the Old Testament and the New Testament. In other words, Malachi is God's last word for four centuries. I ask us again, do we think that's significant? I surely do. Now, after four centuries, we have the arrival of God himself in the person of Jesus Christ but this is his last word to people for 400 years. Now, the word Malachi, the actual name Malachi means my messenger. Uh, and Malachi was a, uh, 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 in, in the very best sense of the word, God's messenger. Now watch this. I want to correct what is a common um, mistake by a lot of people whenever we talk about somebody like the prophet Malachi. We have come to think that when you say somebody's a prophet, watch this, that they're only talking about futuristic events. Did you know that of the 17 prophets, the, the sum total of all of their biblical writings, only a very small percentage is about future events. It's there, but it's not the majority, it's the mi minority. Prophets' essential job was they were a mouthpiece for God. The actual Hebrew word prophet or prophecy is prophet, which means mouthpiece for God or one who speaks on God's behalf. Now, shouldn't that be pretty much what every pastor in every local church is doing every week with his people being a mouthpiece for God? Not with stuff that we're making up because we got nothing to say, but to be an accurate mouthpiece that communicates God's word to the people of this era in the Bay in the 21st century. So when you think of prophecy, don't think that it's just futuristic in nature. That's a part of it, but a small part of overall prophecy. Somebody put it this way, prophets usually afflict the comfortable and they comfort the afflicted. Or you could put it this way, pleasant words often are not true and true words often are not pleasant. And Malachi is direct, Malachi is hard hitting, Malachi is a pull no punches. Now, another important thing about Malachi, 
Of the 55 verses in the four chapters of Malachi, 47 are God actually speaking. It is a higher percentage than any other book in the Bible. 47 of the 55 verses. That is highly significant. So it's not going through the filter of oral tradition or human beings. It's coming straight from the heart of the Father to human beings. The people then and people like you and I today. Now, this is the other critical, critical, and final sort of foundational um, application or, or teaching I want to make before we dive in to the 10 symptoms of drifting from our first love. It's so very important. Please, uh, him who has an ear, let him hear this morning. Malachi begins his prophecy, his book, with a foundational assumption which is critical that we get. Check it out, verses 1 and 2. Oracle through the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Remember, Malachi means my messenger. Look at verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. Did you get that? Now, for those of you that are new to the Bible, when you see all that follows the I have loved you, you will be confused. You'll be disturbed even. You're going to say, whoa, 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 whoa. This is not feeling like love. This is feeling like a trip to the woodshed. This is feeling like, whoa, not pleasant stuff. That's exactly the point. We are very one-dimensional in thinking about the love of God for us. Okay, let's talk about human parents. Human parents who do nothing but empower their children's immaturity, who cave to every demand of their child when they throw a little conniption fit or whatever. You know what we call those parents? Bad parents. And God is a perfect parent. And in his love for us, there's a lot of, I'll just use the phrase, warm, fuzzy stuff that makes us feel good and brings solace to the deep, legitimate wounds of our lives but there's also discipline and correction. And those things are as much the love of God as all the rest of the stuff. Did you get that? Okay, in case you don't believe me, I'm gonna give you two references that I want you to write down and look up this week. I'm gonna begin in the New Testament, one from the New Testament, one from the Old. I'm in Hebrews 12. Let me read to you verses five through 11 what God says. And have you forgotten, my children, so he's speaking to people of faith, have you forgotten the words of encouragement that dresses you as God's sons and daughters? Here it is. My son, I'm in verse 5 of Hebrews 12. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when the Lord rebukes you. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. Look up at me here, everybody. How many of you love to be disciplined by your parents and your little kids? I mean, the horror. Okay, this guy's sick over here. Okay, so. <laughs> We're not the ultimate words of terror. Wait till your father gets home. I mean, that is cruel and unusual punishment. That's not right. I mean, I'm calling CPS right now. Okay. Notice, do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines those he loves. He punishes everyone he accepts as a son and daughter. You say, John, why would he do that? I already told you, we talked about it. To conform us to the image of his son, Jesus Christ, right? But I'm not done. Verse seven, endure hardship as discipline because God is treating you as sons and daughters. For what son or daughter is not disciplined by their father? And if you're not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons and daughters of God. Hello? Verse 9, moreover, we all have human fathers who disciplined us, and we respect them for it. How much more should we submit to the Father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. This making sense to you all this morning? Last verse, check it out, verse 11. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but it is painful. Boy, true words were never spoken. Later on, however, later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. 
Do you know how comprehensive that teaching is throughout the whole of Holy Scripture? And it's not taught nearly enough in America's churches. Okay, let's go to the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, I'm in in Proverbs chapter 3, just two quick verses. Proverbs 3, verses 11 and 12. My son and daughter, do not despise the Lord's discipline and do not resent his rebuke because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father, the child he delights in. In Old Testament and in New Testament, we see the evidence that God's I have loved you with an everlasting love includes discipline and includes correction. But it's truth couched in grace. Did you get all that? Okay, let's dive in. There are 10 symptoms at least that Malachi lists among the people in that era of drifting from their first love of the Lord. Now that we understand some context about Malachi, you will discover what I have discovered, that these 10 symptoms are as relevant for people like you and me in the 21st century as they were for the people, ancient Jews in a destroyed nation in the Middle East 2,500 years ago. Here's the first one, fill it in. We begin to drift from our first love for God when we doubt his motivation. When we doubt his motivation. That's why I've spent so much time this morning in the foundation for this reset series in Malachi, making sure that we get God's motivation. Because if we don't understand the Father's motivation, we're going to feel like, oh man, God's being mean to me. He doesn't like me at all. He's picking on me. What's the matter with him? Okay? And I hear believers say those kinds of things, honestly, pretty often. Now, look at verses, just verse 2. I have loved you, says the Lord. And I want to stop there. Now, to be fair to context, the specific reference here to God's love is in relation to the historical tension between the descendants of Jacob and Esau. I recognize that. When I was preparing to teach this series, uh, Reset to this wonderful church, uh, there are so many things that it's my job to do as a one seeking to be a student of the Bible and then a teacher of the Bible. And I, I don't claim either of those things. I'll let the Lord decide. You've got to decide what's worth going into detail about and what's not worth it. And if I took the 15 minutes to explain the historical tension and animosity between Jacob and Esau, at the end of the 15 minutes, you probably still wouldn't care very much. And it doesn't make a whole lot of difference to the text. Do you understand what I'm saying? By the time I chewed up 15 minutes, uh, I lose the edge of your optimal attention moment when we can get to much more important stuff. Bottom line is, God's motivation is has been, and always will be, love. That is not something unique to Malachi. It is from Genesis to Revelation that we see the everlasting love of the Lord for human beings created in his image. He has not given up on us as a people, as a planet, As a human family, he is committed to redeeming us, saving us, forgiving us, buying us back. That's what the word redemption means. And restoring a relationship with us that was broken in the garden when our ancestors walked away from God. Okay, did you get that? We also know now that his love includes discipline and correction, doesn't it? But we'll get to that in a moment. Now... When we begin to doubt God's motivation of love toward us, you know what we're going to begin to say? We're going to begin to say things like, he doesn't care about me. Things like, he's not even there. Things like, why did he let this happen in my life? Things like, how could he do this to me? Things like, Why doesn't he do something and fix this pain I'm in? And I could go on and on. 
How many of you ever in secret places in your mind and heart or even verbalized with the close confidant thoughts and feelings like that? Where is God? And does he know what I'm going through? That's why I say our default setting has got to be always in our faith. Our default setting, right, is always God loves me. And so this difficulty that I'm going through, he is either permitting or willing or allowing. And so I'm not going to go viral neutral. I'm not going to cave. I'm not going to capitulate. I'm not going to have a massive narcissistic pity party and woe is me. I will cry. I will weep. I will have some dark nights in the soul. But I know in whom I have believed and his love for me and am persuaded that he's able to keep what I've entrusted to him against that day. No, sir, I will not quit walking with God. I will not forsake the Lord. I will not walk away from my God. See, if that's our default setting. So let's practice. Say it with me three times. Close your eyes throughout the house. And I want you to emphasize the word me, as in yourself, me. And say with me three times, God loves me, go. God loves me. God loves me. God loves me. And of the myriad verses that reinforce that central truth about the Bible, how about Jeremiah 29, 11? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. That's the kind of commitment the Father has to us. Does that make sense this morning? Okay, number two, fill it in, would you? Dishonoring the Lord. Dishonoring the Lord. This is the second symptom of spiritual drift from our first love for the Lord. It's when we have, first of all, begin to doubt his true motivation of love toward us, and then we move in a place in our life where we begin to disrespect God, dishonor God, have a flippant, arrogant, careless attitude toward the Lord and the things of God. Check out with me verse number six. A son honors his father... And a servant honors his master. God is asking if I am a father, and he is. The Bible says we can call him Abba, Daddy, Father. If I am a father, where is the honor due me, says the Lord? If I am a master, where is the respect due me, says the Lord Almighty? See, drift happens when we lose reverence For God. In fact, it's so important that in the Ten Commandments, the first four commandments that deal vertically with our relationship with God, God said, You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. In other words, when we begin to treat the holy things of God in a flippant, careless way, the Bible clearly teaches. that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, that knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And when we begin to treat God with dishonor and disrespect, we are putting ourselves in a, a place, honestly, of spiritual danger. A red flag is waving. Now, I'm not talking here about legalism. I'm not talking here about hearkening back to the good old days where people tippy toed on eggshells around the Lord. However, It's not a bad idea. Remember, he is the Lord. And he is holy. He is the Lord. And he is holy. Now you say, John, why is this honoring and respecting of God so important? Man, oh man, have I got an important thing to say to you now, and it's this. The reason it's so important is because you and I cannot love someone that we do not respect. If I was a smart pastor and I've never been accused of that, I'd say, amen, God bless you, go on home. Because that is a powerful statement I just made. We cannot respect somebody that we do not love. So let's talk about a human relationship. 
When a marriage begins to break down and husbands and wives say to each other, to their counselor, to their girlfriend or on social media, whatever, I don't love him anymore. I don't love her anymore. I promise you that preceding that has been a deterioration and a disintegration of respect and honor for your spouse. And we can't love somebody that we despise, that that we have contempt for, that we disrespect. And ladies, that's particularly big uh, for you in the unique gift of your gender because the Bible says this in Ephesians chapter five, husbands love your wives, wives respect your husbands. Have you ever seen scorn? Don't, don't look, look at me. Don't look at anybody else right now. Have you ever seen scorn of a wife toward her husband? Just disrespect, scorn. Okay, and, and sometimes it's all over her face. She doesn't love him anymore. Okay, let's go to God. We cannot love the Lord if we do not fear the Lord. You say, John, did you really want to use the word fear? Yes. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Yes, actually, I did. Fear implies a profound reverence for the Lord and the things of God and the book of God and the spirit of God and the mission of God. Profound reverence for. Can I make a suggestion, parent to parent, that you caregivers, parents, and so forth, be very, very faithful in teaching your sons and daughters to reverence the Lord. Not legalistically, but to reverence the Lord. No more Jesus and Moses were golfing one day jokes and all those things that go in there. We, we can be warm and human about our faith, but let's not go over the line to where we're disrespectful and vulgar and, and in some way uh, treating the name of God in vain. There's a third thing, and we wrap it up this morning. Fill it in. We give God our leftovers. Now, specifically for the people of that day, it was blemished offerings, and for those of you that just said, huh? I'll explain that in just a moment. Giving God our leftovers is the third charge of Malachi against the people. Uh, The third symptom of spiritual drift in our lives in reference to first love for the Lord. Check it out with me, verses 7 and 8 and 13 and 14. How have we shown contempt for your name? I'm at the end of verse 6. How have we shown contempt for your name, O Lord? And by the way, I have to say something very important here I've forgotten. Do you know, because if you look up earlier one verse in verse, I mean one sentence in verse six, God says, it is you, O priests, who show contempt for my name. This book, uh, straight in the crosshairs of God's primary righteous anger was that the priests... People like me were leading the way in causing people to drift from God. What did Jesus say? When the students fully taught, who do the students become like? Their teacher. So I will tell you, I live in the fear of God whenever I handle this sacred book for this reason. The Bible says those whose work in preaching and teaching will incur a stricter judgment. I will be accountable to him on that day. That causes great reverence and trembling in my heart toward the Lord. I want to fall on my face before him. And I'm not being sensational here. I am saying I literally feel that impulse when I handle the oracles of God. For those of you that are feeling a call to full-time vocational ministry, if it's God's call for your life, don't shy away from it, but know that it comes with a price. Because when we handle the book of God, it brings with it great responsibility. So it's almost now a dialogue in verse 6 and following chapter 1 of Malachi between God and the priest saying, it's you, O priest, who's shown contempt for my name. And the priests say, but how have we shown contempt for your name? Look at verse 7. You've placed defiled food on my altar, says the Lord. 
But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible? Because when you bring blind animals for sacrifice, is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled and diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Yeah, that's right. Give them to Jerry Brown. See if he likes them. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept your offerings, says the Lord Almighty? Now, it goes on. Verse 10. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors. Just shut up, church, and y'all go on home. So that you would not light useless fires in my altar. See, the people's hearts have drifted from God, the priests especially. They're still going through all the religious, religious rigmarole, lighting the altar fire and offering the prescribed animals, although blemished offerings, defective animals. And they're just going through the religious motion. Do you know how toxic that is to human beings like you and me? We can keep doing the same religious thing for decades. And our heart has been adrift from God equally for decades. Let's go on. So that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I'm in verse 10. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offerings from your hands. He says, I don't even want them. Quit giving me your junk. You dishonor me. You disrespect me, says the Lord. That's what's really going on here, everybody. Notice, here is the essential concern of the Father. Verse 11, my name will be great among the nations from the rising to the setting of the sun. Now go all the way to the last sentence of chapter 1 and verse 14. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. In other words, God's name, God's reputation, God's truth is being shamed. It's a sham. It's a joke. It's, it's in the National Enquirer. It's in all the scandalous publications. Why? Because God's so-called people are living such a mockery of their faith. When we live a mockery of our faith, does that cause unbelievers to honor the Lord or dishonor the Lord? You know the answer. It causes them to dishonor the Lord because they say to themselves, is this, if this so-called religious person has such flippant disregard and treats something they say is so sacred in their life so carelessly, then there is no God. And if there is, he's not truth, he's not real, he's a liar, he's a joke, he's a hoax, he's a figment of the imagination. That's what happens when we live lives of hypocrisy, when we give God our blemished offerings. Check out the rest of it. Verse 12, but you profane my name by saying of the Lord's table, it's defiled and of its food, it's contemptible, and you say, what a burden, and you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. Look at me. You know what it means to sniff contemptuously? Let me help you out with a visual image. You ever raised a 12-year-old girl? I raised two of them. And by the way, not just girls, guys. I raised two little boys as well. Kids can come into their teens. All of a sudden, God died and made them God, and they know everything, and parents are an unnecessary appendage on the face of the planet, except for paying the mortgage, okay? And they sniff contemptuously. Um... If our children in the Greg home ever sniff contemptuously, they only did it once. Because the corresponding response was not pleasant. And they really started sniffing contemptuously at their mother at that age period in their life. And a bigger problem with the boys. And I got to tell you, we had some very immediate, decisive conversations about that. And I cured them. Sniffing contemptuously. That's what the people are doing for God. There is arrogance. Who needs you? I'll do what I want. I've got this figured out. You're nothing. I'm the man. You know, there's only one on the throne of our lives. And that's essentially what humanism is. Humanism says, I, mankind, on the altar of myself, I'm the epicenter of my life. Or it's people that have said, nevertheless, not I live, but Christ lives in me. I have died, and now my life is hidden with Christ in God, in Jesus Christ. I am seeking to be the one, to be the Lord and ruler of my life. Look at the rest of it. 
When you bring injured, crippled, or diseased animals, I'm in verse 13, and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord? Now notice the words, cursed is the cheat. We're cheaters. Circle the word cheat. When we have an acceptable male in our flock and vows to give it to God, but then we sacrifice the blemish animal in a quick slate of hand. My words, not the Bible's. Okay, you say, John, what's going on here? Listen hard, I'll be quick and we'll wrap this up. This uh, takes a little leap of understanding because America is not an agricultural um, land today. I'm, I'm personally not aware of anybody in our church family that makes their livelihood by tending flocks and herds. Is somebody in here that that's how you provide your way of living? By the way, for much of the world today, still, that's how, especially among the Bedouin peoples, how they sustain themselves in very arid, sort of desolate climates. Their wealth was their animals. So, in the Old Testament sacrificial system, there were animal offerings given, and this is all preparatory to the coming of the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world, Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, animal offerings were given proportionate to and commensurate with one sin. So if you committed a smaller sin, you might bring a pigeon. If you committed a whopper of a sin, you might bring a cow, right? But what God said repeatedly, whatever you bring to sacrifice to the Lord for your sin, or whether it's even a fellowship offering to the Lord or whatever, never, ever, 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 never bring a crippled or uh, imperfect or blemished animal. Because if that was their livelihood and people were doing that, you know what they were doing? They were watching their economic bottom line. I'm enough of a farm boy to tell you that if you've got a one-legged three or a three-legged one-eyed sheep in your herds, you got to cull it out. I don't mean to be cruel here, but genetics, you don't want that animal breeding because it will produce more subpar blemished animals. So what the people were doing saying, okay, I'll go through the religious ritual, and what I'm going to give to God here is, you know, that sheep, he's ugly, he's got the wrong color wool, and, you know, he's got one eye, and that's cross-eyed, and he's only got two legs, let's get him out of here. And they would bring that to the Lord, and that was the issue. And the priests were the worst of all. Do you know there's always a way to manipulate our relationship with God if we have a mind to? And that's exactly what's going on here. God says, I am offended that you do this to me, says the Lord. And so it would be like this. You and I, just one aspect of our uh, spiritual lives, you and I saying, okay, I'm at the end of my month here, and I only have this little bit left over. Bummer. I mean, I've done all that I want with all that is mine and all my money. I guess I'll give this little left over to the Lord. He'll understand. And my response to that would be, yes, he'll understand. What he immediately understands is that our heart is not fully his. That's what he understands. And that's not just about money. That's about everything uh, in our lives in reference to God. That's why we say uh, ad nauseum around this culture that we are not the owners. We are managers only. So the questions we got to ask ourselves is, are we giving God our leftovers? Are we giving him only second best in our life or eighth best in our life? Are we giving him less than the cream of time, talent, and tithe in our life? Are we cutting corners in our lives? Are we only offering to the Lord blind, disease, crippled, pitiful excuses for an offering? In our lives, are we only giving him the scraps from the fringes of our lives? Is that really what we're doing? And is that really who we want to be? God says, I'm a great king among the nations, and my name must be honored among the nations from the rising to the setting of the sun. But my children, this will never happen when your heart and your attitude and your behavior toward me is like this. I close with this thought that it's a tragic irony in our day that much of what, what represents Christ followers in America today, Christians, you know, is that so often we've drifted into becoming disciples of ourselves and disciples of our consumeristic success, drunk, pleasure-worshiping culture. We are to be salt and light. We are to be different, not in an arrogant, pretentious, religious way, but in a way of humility and in a way of a fiery passion to know and serve 
and love the Lord only. When we leave this morning, let's reset our lives with these first three applications. Believing fully in God's love for us, which includes discipline, correction. Number two, honoring the Lord with the reverence due his holy name. And number three, giving God our first and our best every single time. And everyone said, stand to your feet, would you please, friends, and bow your heads in prayer. Holy God, make us holy in ways that you who sees the heart and all of its motivations and inclinations know that truly within us is being forged the character of Jesus Christ our Lord. If you must, Abba, turn up the heat that we might become all that you call us to be for your glory. Lord, we love you. Amen.